and uh, my good morning to you all as well. Um, I haven't got a title for my sermon, but I think you'll catch the theme on the way through, hopefully. Questions. Why aren't we more excited and passionate about the promise of this particular gift? Why don't we hear more sermons preached based on the promise of this amazing gift? Is there anything more important down the track of life than the faithful promise of this wondrous gift from God? Because was not this gift of gifts the principal reason for Jesus' miraculous entry into our world of sin to live, promote, promise and to finally suffer and die upon a wooden cross to pay the price that was required of his Father in heaven? Yes, the principal reason. So what is this gift of gifts that should excite us more and more during these final days of Earth's history. I'm sure you have already guessed. So here with are my thoughts in elaboration. While there is no specific set time in each Christian person's life to feel the need or compulsion to give serious thought to an afterlife, yet in my opinion, I still believe a certain time to address this great Bible truth does actually come about at some stage of a Christian experience. Question, but why the importance of thoughts pertaining to eternal life? Is there a significant aspect attached to this particular subject? Why give it extra thought anyway? After all, Eternal life has always been the hope and assurance of every Christian person down through the ages. So why then make such a fuss or feature of this particular Bible truth, Basil Ford, when there are so many other wonderful Bible subjects and similar material of merit that can benefit the person of God here and now? Agreed, maybe. But this little combination of two words sublimely wraps up the assured future of every son and daughter of God who in faith have made a real a pact or covenant with the Almighty. Eternal life. So while the words read, God is love, which he most assuredly is, and as well the author and owner of every other profound wondrous trait built into his perfect character. Yet these two words sum up a hereafter that should suggest, surely, new unending life as God's second most wonderful gift to humanity. So what we have is God's expression of love through Jesus, his tangible gift to humanity especially so to his sons and daughters, truly God's unspeakable gift. Then to his other future gift, his promise of reinstatement of that which was lost or stolen from him, following Eden's brush with the enemy of God and mankind. But why again give it so much serious thought to eternal life? when we are presently enjoying the fullness of life here and now. I guess the main reason is we know this present life is only for a season and for many of us that season could end at any time. Hence the importance of accepting his future gift, i.e. eternal life. However, the answer to all the whys attached to the importance of the reality of these two words can be easily found in God's profound expression of love in giving his son Jesus to mankind because without his sacrifice upon Calvary's cross, the beautiful words of eternal life would be unknown and worthless. 
So let's see if this part text from John 10, verse 10, sums up better what I have just commented on. I, Jesus, am come that they, us included, might have life, and that they, us included again, might have it more abundantly. So life here and now upon accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour is presently that more abundant life. But the thought also carries over to the assurance of eternal life proper, which is really the superversion of the more abundant life Jesus was promoting. And thankfully one doesn't even need a mass of this world's goods and cash to be eligible for this here and now abundant life as promised, which comes to us entirely free when we know and love him as we ought. When you are a normal, healthy child, with your whole life ahead of you, and fortunate to be living in a stable, democratic country, and have two caring and loving parents who have succeeded in providing a comfortable family home with a loving environment thrown in for good measure, then it would be somewhat unusual for such a child to want for anything more, even thoughts pertaining to eternal life. With so much excitement and prospect at every turn, such a child would naturally feel it wasn't necessary to give much thought to eternal life, simply because each day was providing so much variety and old age was an eternity away. Saying it another way, a very normal situation and at such an age I'm sure God would not expect it to be otherwise. In normal circumstances, as I've tried to imply, Childhood should be beautiful and devoid of worry with no need whatsoever to dwell on the promise of a much, much better hereafter life. Even though Christian parents will at an early age seek to introduce such thoughts into their young thinking. At such an age, the present is a natural end thing with the future just so far in the distance therefore with no need for understanding. But before very long, such childhood bliss gives way to teen years with a variety of different interests and a whole lot more excitement added. Schooling and education also account for the absorption of a lot of time. Friendships are developed and some will last for a lifetime. These seven years are so crammed with interests, etc., and even though a thorough Christian upbringing has been the challenge of both Christian parents, thoughts of eternal life, though, now beginning to make some impact on the teen's thinking, is still somewhat blurred and just too far in the distance to register urgency of thought generally speaking. Life during these ad adolescent years can be and should be a fantastic experience and probably the most challenging years during their development to adulthood. I'm sure most of us can think back to those years in our young lives when the thoughts of eternal life were put on the back burner to be addressed at a later date when all those here and now tangible interests had fully run their course. Yet, for some of these young Christian teens, the thought of the prospect of eternal life can begin to register as God intended it should, when an understanding of Jesus' mission is grasped and appreciated. And yet, as has always been the case, the idea of everlasting life or eternal life has always had a type of mystic attached to it. It's been difficult to comprehend or believe 
that there can be a physical hereafter as promised by our great God. To be automatically changed from living in an imperfect body to a perfect one or to be perfectly rebuilt from a deceased one to thereafter begin to live for an eternity requires a powerful lot of faith especially for a teenager with a full life ahead of them and all the time in the world to translate dreams into reality. But these teen years don't last long either and before very long we are enjoying or should be enjoying the prime years of our lives that now encompass a whole new set of interests, ideals, values, challenges, obligations, etc., an exciting time in the lives of those who are blessed with good health and all other circumstances that gel for happiness. These years for a Christian person are the further developmental years of character when spiritual values become more intense and more appreciated. The hereafter is given much more thought with the realisation of the finality of death starting to impact on a person's forward thinking. Knowing for certain what the outcome has in store for them at some future date. Such future event is a certainty. Even kings and queens, the high and the mighty, society persons, rich and poor, are all in the same boat when their turn comes to exit this life. This death thing is the enemy thing that preys on the lives of every person born into this world and is of satanic origin. And not only humans, it invades or ultimately deals to everything that has had life infused into it by the creator God. But returning to these prime years of our lives, these fantastic years, when most are given a tiny taste of heaven, are the years our God expects us to or invites us to look further ahead to the numerous promises he supplied us with in regard to the life eternal prospect or certainty. It was during his prime years that God's son, Jesus Christ, had his taste of death. And yet, he was the only one ever in the history of this world who could have bypassed it and returned to his Father in heaven, given sinful humanity a miss, given it the cold shoulder, as it rightly deserved it should have been given. Thankfully, the most powerful force prevailed and love compelled him to honour all those numerous promises of eternal life with him in heaven first and later on planet earth made brand new again. Still with these prime years of our lives, I want to touch on another biblical character who was wise enough to want something better than this life, even though it seems he already had all that it had to offer. So how did it turn out for him? Now I guess if this young biblical man, as the record suggests his age bracket to be, if he was living today, he might well be classified as a successful entrepreneur and as a result could well have acquired a considerable variety of assets. But this does not imply any guilt issue by using to advantage the good brain God would have blessed him with. Or the same person today could well have inherited enough livestock to make many of his fellows and friends envious. And to top off this very attractive situation in life, he also held a top rulership position on his area's council. And of course, 
he would not have needed his two legs to transport him to a person he was confident could give him an answer to an afterlife possibility. Well, the actual biblical account of this young ruler would suggest that in his day, he would have been an equal to our 21st century person who we have just portrayed. He was a proud owner of great possessions. Another uh, account reads, quote, he was very rich. But his elevated standing in society is not the lesson Jesus would want us to benefit from. You couldn't anyway. After all, the world in Jesus' day and our day has always had its well-to-do people. Such status issue never impressed Jesus. So one could well deduce from the three gospel writers that this young man wanted for nothing. He had it all. Riches, youth, position, status. And as well, he had been in receipt of an excellent spiritual upbringing. His character couldn't be folded outwardly, and yet it was inwardly remiss in a certain area. And yet again, to his way of thinking, he was happily and successfully set up in life and in need of nothing more. The trouble was, though, his mind was not completely at rest. He had a real worry. And he wanted, above everything else, to get this bit right as well. Even though others looking on would gladly have exchanged their lives for his, as they noted how blessed and well set up in life he obviously was. So why then was he so troubled? What was still bugging him that compelled him to come running to finally kneel before Jesus in respect and request. For somehow he knew Jesus could put him right on this one last thing. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? I've chosen to not take the story any further than this at the moment. Now this other person could well have also been in the same age group. His true account comes to us from the pen of the same writer, namely the Apostle Luke. As a matter of interest, both Matthew and Mark record the rich young ruler's inquiry of Jesus in regard to eternal life, as does Luke. But Luke also gives us, in addition, another similar inquiry of Jesus along the same lines as that of the rich young ruler, i.e. eternal life. In passing, John's Gospel doesn't mention either of the two accounts. Now, I don't know how they qualified those days, but this second person was known to be a lawyer and most likely a fairly smart one at that. He actually thought he was smart enough to question Jesus on the same subject, eternal life. I think we could well conclude that his was along the lines of an intellectual inquiry, as against the rich young ruler's heartfelt inquiry. However, the record suggests that this lawyer had it in his mind to test Jesus or, as it is recorded, to tempt him. He hadn't come running. He stood up in the crowd so all could witness how he was going to prevail in his encounter with the Son of God. However, he did exercise some respect in his introduction. Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? exactly the same phraseology as the rich young ruler. How do you interpret the law? Was Jesus' question to him in return. Well answered the lawyer, it's a matter of love to God with all one's heart, soul, strength and mind and to treat one's neighbour as one would treat oneself. 
a magnificent answer, friends. Jesus said, you're on the right track. But the lawyer, true to form, wanted to have the last say because it seems he wasn't practising the second command, his neighbour as himself requirement. So Jesus had to further embark on the lesson of the Good Samaritan. Now just to recap for a moment, so far we have looked at childhood and accepted it would be unusual for any in this tender age group to comprehend eternal life, the idea or promise, and all that it was going to entail, even though Christian parents would be introducing heaven as opportunities arose. Then to those teen years when there was usually too much excitement to give serious thought to an eternity with the Godhead in heaven. Nevertheless, it could still become an attractive exercise in thought and reality. And many a young person has grasped the prospect of eternal life with fervour and faith. Eternal life. These two words make for a beautiful combination. And in adulthood, for the Christian person, they begin to convey a very realistic hope and assurance, with heaven being accepted as a future certainty. The very rich young ruler was the first Bible person who dearly wanted to know why he didn't feel confident of attaining to eternal life subsequent to his earthly one running its natural course. He was dead earnest in his seeking the missing bit in his spiritual makeup. So much so that he ran and knelt at the feet of Jesus. But when Jesus touched on the sensitive part of his life, his wallet content, he departed in sorrow. The ask was just too much. The other sad aspect is that the record tells us Jesus instantly loved him and wanted him to join his other disciples in the shared work of saving souls for eternal life. As for the second inquiring personality, the lawyer, well, we noted that he too asked the same question of Jesus, but his wasn't the sincere version that came from the lips of the rich young ruler. His was the smart, probing inquiry. A clumsy attempt to try and trip Jesus up. Nevertheless, when he was in return tested by Jesus, he was able to produce the perfect answer Jesus wanted. But then he had to learn who his neighbour was when he wanted to have the last probe. The story of the Good Samaritan was the conclusion or the lesson to the lawyer that he was in need of. Anyway, let's move on to the next age group following the prime years of our lives, the 40s, the 50s and through to the 60s. Over these years, Christian folk are usually well settled in their thinking and more likely to give extra serious thought to eternal life becoming a much closer reality to them over these more advanced years. And there shouldn't be too many queries, queries either about God's hereafter plan. And some will even exit life over these years. The desire of every Christian person to one day partake of that much more wonderful joy that most wonderful assurance to live again for an eternity. How could any thoughts transcend those, transcend those of an assurance of an everlasting hereafter? Being clothed in a perfect body, sin-free, and knowing that nothing was going to change. Aspirations ever-present with a knowledge that all could be attended to over time. Time that was always in abundance in this new perfect body that had eternal mechanisms built into it that never wore out or needed repair. Jesus was outlining 
the bread of life lesson as he taught in the synagogue at Capernaum. His 12 chosen disciples were in attendance, as were many others who also considered themselves to be part of his special company. The lesson portrayed him being that bread that came down from heaven as against the manna that their wilderness forebears had eaten and were now dead. The New Testament requirement for believers was to spiritually absorb his life, his flesh and blood into their own systems so that newness of life could take effect, making the satisfying difference. But when he spelled out what should have been a spiritual lesson, many took it to mean a literal eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. They couldn't grasp the significance between the spiritual and the literal and complained. Many, the record tells us, said it was a hard saying. They could not simply come to grips with this new version of true discipleship, with even the chosen 12 also beginning to murmur, prompting Jesus to inquire as to whether it had also offended them. It's only a brief outline of this famous lesson that had a sad conclusion to it. The record reads, from that time, many of his I've added, other disciples went back and walked no more with him, prompting Jesus to inquire of the twelve, are you also going to separate yourselves from me? What a sad inquiry, friends. But Peter's magnificent reply must have thrilled Jesus. The bond would not be broken. Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. Eternal life was all important to these men. They knew no other could offer them such a hereafter gift. And to finally cement the deal, Peter added, and we believe and are sure that you are that Christ, the Son of the living God. Has there ever been a more beautiful testimony, friends? Jesus was eternal life to them, even in the promised state. But with, this, with little of this world's goods at that time, he was ultimately going to make it a literal experience for them, barring the one who was a counterfeit. But returning to the various age groups we have touched on, I want to conclude with those of us who are in the sunset category of their lives and this most definitely takes in Basil Ford. Most of, this, of us in this group have walked the Christian pathway for a great number of years and have made our calling and election to the gospel of Jesus Christ a top priority. And in regard to eternal life, you could say, we are the ones who have to be doubly sure in accepting or claiming the hereafter promise of eternal life, seeing this present one could run out at any time. Such fact is a, re is a reality, as we all know. However, in any age group, life can be interrupted by a vast number of reasons other than solely age which makes it imperative that our commitment to Jesus Christ be always our top priority in life, that eternal life be always that much-awaited gift of Jesus Christ and his Father. Jesus was nearing the end of his earthly ministry. He had outlined to his disciples the lesson of the true vine, along with illustration and as well many other basics of genuine discipleship. He knew too at this stage exactly what lay directly ahead of him if mankind was to be given a second chance of life, an eternal one this time, 
as against the temporary one endured for only a short number of years, with all manner of unpleasantness, sickness, strife, unhappiness, suffering, and finally death thrown into the mix. And so it was, with his three odd years of personal ministry coming to an end, and his acute awareness of what his final time on planet Earth had in store for him, on behalf of mankind, his special creation, he felt the need to engage in fervent prayer for special strength and comfort. And so the scene is set for Jesus to open up his heart to his Father in heaven. John 17 records this for us. These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes and to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son so that your Son can glorify you. You have given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him or who have accepted him, your Son. Then we come to the key that unlocks all that the plan of salvation embodies. In my Bible, I have felt inspired to write alongside this text just two words that I feel sum it all up in a nutshell. The words I've written are the key. And as I've grown older, the more I have appreciated the essence of this next verse in John's Gospel account, chapter 17, verse 3. And Jesus is praying to his Father, quote, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. To me... This verse sums up, in essence, the secret of the plan of salvation. So what is eternal life? Answer. This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you, God, have sent, repeating. And what's the best way for yourselves and myself to know them both? Answer again, on our knees in regular prayer to God the Father. Study of God's word is expected of us, is superb and beneficial and cements our faith. But prayer is the ultimate to forming that relationship bond which gives us an assurance of eternal life. Eternal life. Just two words, two fantastic words, but what a future hanging on them. Surely a future we all crave for. And when Jesus returns, eternal, eternal life begins, begins in earnest or proper. It's an actual, a very real life happening or experience to be changed in the twinkling of an eye and caught up in the atmosphere to begin the journey to heaven in the place Jesus said he was going to prepare for his sons and daughters. Eternal life. We have to accept the promise and faith as bona fide because our puny minds just cannot come to grips with or imagine the magnitude of it all. It's just so incomprehensible. And yet, repeating again, it's going to be a fact. Paul outlines the only two outcomes at the end of every person's road. Put very plainly to the Romans, Christians, at that time he simply states that the wages of sin will be death, and that's the final version, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, unending. And in respect of promises, John tells us that, quote, and this is the promise that he hath promised us, 
even eternal life. So how can I sum up these few thoughts as presented this morning? Well, I think we have to return again to that passage of scripture where the whole plan of salvation is summed up in the body of just one text which I suggested earlier, represented the key to the whole plan of salvation. And this is life eternal, that they, including ourselves, might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you, the Father, have sent. And there is only one word, friends, that fits this requirement. Relationship is that word. Relationship with these two is the full embodiment of the plan of salvation, i.e., God the Father through Jesus Christ. This is the key that unlocks the future promise of eternal life. And it all became a possibility when the Son of God paid the ultimate price for us, even his death upon Calvary's cross. He was only 30 years odd of age. A fully qualified accountant, as was also his wife. Through the faithful sharing work of the Bible truths, the doctrines, etc., by a conscientious church member, both were finally baptised and joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Wangarei. A short time later, he was studying for the ministry in Australia and was later ordained as a minister of the gospel and with his family served in various locations as well as the island fields of the Pacific. Fifty years on, now in retirement and in the Tauranga Church, June and I were privileged to hear him share a sermon with the rest of the congregation. He didn't know that we were in attendance until we met him at the door following his sermon. After exchanging some friendship talk, I told him how I agreed implicitly with the theme of his sermon subject, which was based on relationship. He had made a nice job of pointing out it was because of such an intimate relationship with their God that two Old Testament personalities were thought to be worthy of translation without first having to experience death. Then he went on to emphasise to me that he had not always thought that relationship with God and his son Jesus was the top priority in his personal Christian experience. Inferring, I assumed that along the line somewhere he was content to be satisfied with the correctness of the Bible's cardinal truths as promoted by his newfound church. That was until relationship registered as a new focal point of his Christian experience. This significant change of thinking direction for him truly warmed my heart because it's just so easy to believe that, yes, the truths of God's word, doctrine, correctness, is sufficient and the answer or key to e entry to eternal life one day. Yes, a correct understanding of them is of wonderful spiritual value, don't get me wrong, and is expected of God. But relationship with the eternal three, more correctly, prepares us for eternal life. It's the guarantee of entitlement and has to rate for me as the basis of my quest for one day sharing in God's future gift. Eternal life. God's unspeakable gift through Jesus Christ is my recommendation 
from today's message. And may God bless you all. Amen. So we're going to sing our final hymn. And appropriately, it's the glory song. Thank you, musicians. <laughs>